So this is the Whole Man Academy podcast. I'm Anthony Asprey. My guest today is the wonderful Jim Brown. Uh, Jim is a CEO of Round 8, which we we're going to get onto later, but is let's call it a recruitment company, but it's a lot more than that. Um, founder and a coach of uh, Ground and Air, which again, we're going to touch on. But that's about coaching, development, insights, uh, working with boards, directors and emerging talent, which I know we can all take some, uh, some skills from and some thoughts and ideas. And uh, Jim, welcome to the Whole Man Academy podcast. How are you, sir? And where are you? I'm good, thanks, Anthony. No, I'm in uh, South East London. I'm in Dulwich Village, which is my home. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm all right today. I'm all right. I had a walk around the park and did a bit of prep for this. Yeah. So what, far, so good. The, the sun's shining, I guess. And how how's it affected you with lockdown? Have you been fine working from home? And I know you've got a family as well. Have I been fine working from home? Uh, it depends what who, who I'm comparing myself to. Uh, no, we're, we're fine. I mean, I, I kicked my kick one of my sons out of his bedroom, um, but we've got a spare room for him. So that's this has become my man cave, and I've kind of hung you know Nigel Ben boxing gloves up here and all sorts. I'm quite enjoying that having a man cave, but being in the house and you know being told what to do all the time by my wife and and this list of jobs and things is not ideal. Um, <laughs> And business-wise, you know, it's tough. It's tough. The recruitment business is uh, flatlining at the moment. Coaching business is doing doing well. Um, so yeah, dep- dep- depends what what morning you catch me on, really. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think that uh, kind of e- echo that with a lot of the guys that we spoke to either through the Whole Man Academy uh, podcast and or our Zoom calls is one of the things was that a lot of guys were forced to work from home without any real preparation. So as opposed to saying, I've got a dedicated workspace, it was like, let's clear out a spare room or a, you know, one of the guys is working in his shed. Yeah. Um, because if you've got kids around and, you know, partners and everything, it's, it's tough to, some of those blurred lines between you're at work or you're at home. It's, I mean, it's, you probably talked about it with other guests, but it's totally blurred, line, blurred lines. You know, I, I mean, I, I've, I've never worked a weekend in my entire career, and it's just been a rule of mine. I've worked hard, I've worked late at times, but I've never worked a weekend, and you know, until now. And then now it's all just a complete blurb. Yeah. But you know, needs must, and yeah, no, it's seeing it's, more of the kids than I was, which is great. I was going to say, there's the there's as we know a, you know a bit about mindset. There's there's the positives and the negatives from it, and you can decide what which ones you focus on. Um, yeah. I know I know when I was recording a podcast the other day, and our little one was banging on the door because uh, he wanted to tell me that lunch was ready, and you're just like, just take a breath and just you know the recording's not ruined, but, um, yeah. but we're we're yeah. we're learning. Well, let's get into it. With um, firstly, it was about round eight, and I and I touched on it in the um, introduction that it's it's more than a recruitment company. Um, but what I loved when I read about it was where you said we introduce world leading talent to world leading companies. Yeah, so so it, it, it is a recruitment company um, uh, in the sense that we find that we find talent for businesses and we charge the businesses for that. Um, we have an exec search uh, arm now, which uh, focuses more at senior level, and, and and some of that's a lot of that's retained business. So I guess we're kind of a hybrid between an exec search firm and a recruitment business. We basically find commercial and operational people for media companies, mainly publishers, but also media agencies and technology businesses. So we deal with lots of different publishers, everyone from, you know, Hearst and uh, Microsoft to um, Vice and Refinery29. So huge, huge range across business and consumer, but mainly consumer. Um, And and I know you said with... Obviously, it's been affected at the moment because what is the state of recruitment? Do you think has everybody just kind of shut down and just doing their own thing for the moment, and and, and that it's now waking up again? It's such a big industry. I mean, it's about it's a thirty three billion pound industry in the UK alone. So it's hard for me to give you a useful answer around that because there are just so many different sectors. Yeah, my sector has been completely torpedoed by this for now. Um, and it was a sector that was already uh, being squeezed. Um, it's hard to think of what sectors are booming now, apart from, you know, some some areas of tech. Um, but but you know, it, it will come back. I mean, it, it will come back. Who, who the hell knows at the moment um, yeah. when? But um, you know, we've we've been through this before a few times. Yeah. Not this, but you know, we launched. We launched yeah, I mean, we launched Round Eight in. Uh, 
Well, I came out of university actually just just um, in the 90s recession and then we launched round eight just as the dot-com boom was about to, to happen. And then we had 9-11, which just everything stopped for a while and then global financial crisis. So I feel, you know, I feel at least we've got some experience to kind of draw from. Yeah. No, it's, a, it, it's an interesting time for a lot of people. And a, a good example was a chap I was speaking to who was very, very high up in a, in a, a big company. And he moved literally just before um, you know, kind of lockdown to another firm and is on a very big salary and is, feels really embarrassed now because he can't cultivate relationships and, you know, do the usual go to London and meet new clients and what have you, because, you know, you're, you're not allowed to. So I know there's, you know, for, for some guys, especially for someone like him, it was actually really hard because you're at home knowing you're being paid a big salary and being slightly embarrassed by it because you can't actually do much uh, i mean you know who knows who knows where his head his head's at but that must be really hard particularly when when you relying on building relationships at the new firm to yeah you know to secure your job it must be really really difficult yes yeah, it's not quite the same as saying you know should we should jump on zoom for a beer later on um and i, I guess for yourself one of the questions that came into my head when I was looking at your background was how do you find world leading talent? I mean, does it, do the people come to you or do you kind of go looking for it? Well, we've been trading for uh, just shy of 21 years. So obviously we, we come into contact with lots of people at different levels and, we, and we've kept that contact kept going. Um, find, finding talent is easy now you know you've linkedin is just a wonderful tool for that i think identifying the talent that's really relevant for a business is is a, a lot of where the skill comes in in recruitment um, and then and then engaging with people who are used to being called lots by various other recruitment businesses again is kind of part of part of the art and then managing the process so that the right person joins the right business with the right expectations so that they stay and enjoy it on the right terms so the business and, and them feel that they have value that's 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 when the work comes in i guess and I, I guess for all of us times are changing as you say so so much stuff is online now um do, are you finding with the business on the, on the recruitment side that um you know you're you're changing your working practices because surely previously but you know before uh, before COVID, before lockdown, a lot of it was done face to face, whereas now being able to utilize, you know, Zoom means that actually your reach um, becomes e even greater. Yeah, so there's the, I guess there are positives and negatives to that. Um, Recruitment is one of those industries that it's quite easy to move to, to a virtual world in a sense. And we yeah. were looking at each other and, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, we're all learning how to kind of build that chemistry and that understanding of each other through this medium aren't we and um, um so there's a challenge there but actually fundamentally i can still ask you all the questions about what's important to you where you want to go what, what your talents are how you want to how you want to apply them and, and i can talk you through the options that we have available and and and, and the routes you've taken already and do all of that like this so that's yeah. why there's so many bloody recruitment companies because <laughs> you know before zoom people could set up in their back bedrooms and pick up the phone and and, and do business yeah yeah it's a, I guess, I guess like a, some of the things it's an, there's an easy entry point. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean they're any good at it, but, uh, yeah, think things have changed. Well, I, I know when, uh, again, looking at your background, one of the things was about building teams for global brands. So for guys listening to this, how would he learn to build a, a team either professionally or personally? Like what, what are the tips that you would give on building a team? When you say personally, what, what do you, what just, do you... Um, for let's say a, 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 I'm very much a believer in your kind of the, the sum of the five people you hang around with, um, and, right. and having you know a group, even if it's a group that maybe you um, you know these days you do a Zoom call with like once a month, but it just means that there's a couple yeah. of you helping you stay accountable, um, but possibly more so in business on you know building a team in the right way about it. Um, I th well, I think first of all, and this is a mistake. I think we, we I certainly I've, I've made in hiring people is be, be really, really clear on what you're looking for. Think, be really, really clear on the skill set that you that you absolutely need now uh, and the behaviours of the person that you that you employ, you know, the kind of behaviours that you want them to display in the, in, 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 in the business. I'll, I'll talk about the business first, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, 
So be really, really clear on that. Um, get really clear on, on what your options are and, and you don't need to use a recruitment consultant for that. I think you know, the internet's a wonderful thing. So um, do your research. So walking into that conversation, you're, you're very, very clear about the context in which that person's working now. Um, and also credible in your approach because you understand where they are and what they do and, and what makes them less potentially relevant for you. So that's kind of stage one. Um, I think, um, you know, use your network. If you, if you, if you have one, warm, warm that call up before you get on the call as yeah. much as you can. So, you know, find, find common ground, find uh, connections that, that you both have in common if, if possible. Um, and then, you know, as, as soon as possible on that call, get an understanding of, of where they sit and what they want before you start promoting anything to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and be prepared to, uh, it's a long answer this, um, be, prepared, good. be prepared for them bounce, reflecting all those questions back on you, you know, and, yeah. and have a decent answer for those and have a real answer. Because I think hiring now is so much more about a partnership. It's so much more about uh, um, two people, the employer and the employee, the leader and the, and the, and the, and the team member, um, reaching some consensus about what's important to each other. And that's particularly important with Gen Y um, mm -hmm. um, um, people because they, you know, they expect to be involved. They want a cause. They, they want to know what you stand for. So be really, really clear on that. Right. There's more, but that's... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think that's why it's funny. We might have said before we started recording, it's sometimes it's, especially when you're reading your bio, there's there's so much, and this is why I love interviewing people, there's so much that we could talk about. Uh, the hard bit is what do you leave out? Um, so we could end up doing a, a three-hour podcast. But so I, I wonder with... Um, like with yourself, I mean, you've certainly you know worked for work with some really big companies. And what what's worked for you to stay stay current, stay motivated, stay at whatever your level of success is over the years. Whoa, big old question. Hmm. Uh, I mean, stay well. Two probably two separate things in a way. I think staying current uh, it is about keeping on top of your market and 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 you know, reading, reading the right stuff, ask, you know, to me, I don't really like reading all day. Um, it's, it's, we have a tremendous opportunity in, as recruitment people to learn about a myriad of different businesses, about how they're structured, about what makes them successful, about who fits best um, in that environment and who doesn't. So staying current really is about asking your candidates that, that information and and uh, asking enough of, enough people from different environments to uh, to get a, 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 a sense of balance and mm -hmm. what your attitude to those firms are. So that's I think staying current. That's what that's about. I mean, my market that's been very much about keeping across all the, the technologies. So you know we worked with Bebo and Facebook, uh, Bebo and MySpace, for example, when they were the precursors of Facebook. Yeah worked for companies like Ask Jeeves before, um, which was a kind of early search engine in a way before Google turned up. So it's, you know, making the, your, it's, it's picking the right horses and also looking who's, who's, who's coming up behind them. And, and, uh, and how do you, how do you cope with that at the moment? Because I mean, things are moving so quickly and you know, you're, even if you looked at social media and you take companies like TikTok, which have just exploded in the last year or two, um, how like kind of what sources do you use to, to kind of keep up with uh, keep up with what's going on and what's developing? Uh, well, again, it's back to networks. So the guy who runs TikTok, the, the bit of TikTok that's relevant to my market, um, worked at Microsoft, and I dealt with him a bit there. And before that, he worked somewhere else. And so you know, it's uh, it, it's a really bad example. I'm not I'm not in touch with him, and I bloody well should be. <laughs> Right, but it's 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 just it's it's working your your network. Um, yeah. Again, it's um, I missed the, the the nub of your question. I think Anthony, sorry. It was so how do how do you keep up with it? With yeah, the just because because there's so many different companies around, especially with you know with the launch of five G now, you've got blockchain technology and you've yeah. got different apps. And I yeah, just wondered, kind of if, if someone was trying to get a handle on 
you know, all these different companies coming up, was there kind of a, a, a one website or one place that you kind of go to, to, to try and keep track of all these? No, and no, 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 there isn't really. Um, you've just got to keep your radar up and read a lot and ask, ask, ask the people in the industry what they read mm -hmm. and read that and then read outside of that. So you've got something new to, to add to the conversation. Yeah. So, but it's, you know, it's a head fuck. There's lots, there's lots to get across. Yeah. Yeah, just as but, you, you know, before before TikTok, there was Snap, and I think if you if you knew enough about Snap, then you knew broadly what the what the the the, the concept of, of TikTok was, and and then it's about I guess, and I haven't even done it yet, but it's approaching TikTok and saying, look, you know, we know Snap and we know X, Y, and Z, and and and, yeah. and you know, this is this is what we feel you could add. <laughs> Having already asked the question, what could we add? <laughs> no, it's a. Uh... It's, it's a new world, especially for us guys that are anywhere near 40 and above. We haven't grown up with these. Um, and, you know, it always makes you laugh when you know, I've got friends in their 20s who can put a picture of their shoe on and it will get, you know, 500 likes, whereas, you know, some businesses are, are, are working hard on it and getting, you know, a, a tenth of that or something. So it's... Uh, yeah, do you know what? And, and you're right. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 10 years old, older than you probably. Um, but, you know, in, in your day, it was ringtones. Yeah. And, and and wasn't it probably <laughs> crazy frog exactly and people my age were going well why on earth is anybody dealing with paying however much they were for crazy frog so yeah um it's all a bit it all seems a bit ridiculous when you when you when you're looking at it afresh um but there are yeah. parallels with what's come before action men were ridiculous right mm -hmm. <laughs> the word tamagotchi came to mind but uh tamagotchi, that's brilliant yeah yeah yeah, mine, mine flew out the window of my car as I went round a roundabout, but that's, uh, you know, it still still hurts to this day. And there, were the, there was the odd report of a suicide because mm -hmm. the Tamagotchi got switched off. I mean, you know, God help them if they, if they were true reports, but... Yeah, God help yeah. them if they're looking, looking at their likes on uh, Instagram and linking their, yeah. you know, their, um, their self-worth to their likes, or as, as we say. Right. Um, well, going on, one of the interesting things about the whole Man Academy was was about guys in the UK and for want of a better word, personal development. And I know you obviously working with, with ground and air, it's, it's coaching, um, and it, you know, help, I mean, helping firms, um, evaluate experienced emerging talent, but for yeah. yourself, where, where are you with the personal development of, of yourself and then with, with companies that you're working with? Because in the U in the U S it's such a big business, but in the UK, it's, it's funny how you'll talk about personal development and no particular names come to mind um that that are kind of the, the big names in it so i just wanted for yourself with personal development where you are with it yeah i mean well we chatted about this didn't we off air mm. before actually off air do you still say off air yeah um, apparently uh about tony robbins and how there isn't really a kind of big tony robbins figure in the uk um i mean where am i on my own personal development um i mean i i've, I've always really enjoyed that i've enjoyed that since pre-college i think so um it's always just been part of my activity and i don't mean that i read a business book every day I don't I really don't but um, my first real experience of, of, of personal development um, I guess was I'm um, getting very involved with NLP about 12 years ago which is neuro linguistic programming which is a kind of a, a an, an approach um, which is often used in life coaching and I loved that I just thought it was fascinating um, and then uh, and I and I guess I kind of knitted that into my leadership style uh, in running round eight um, here in, in, in you know in, in, with our Sydney business, and uh, then I kind of heard a lot about CBT, cognitive behaviour therapy, and yeah. the health service was, was was picked up on that in a big way and invested a lot in that as a kind of method to help lots of people get off antidepressants. And um, um, the, the thinking's changed slightly on that now, but that's that that was my first kind of experience of cognitive behaviour therapy. So. I trained as a cognitive behavior coach, so um, I, I'm not a therapist and I haven't been through the years and years of training that it takes to be a therapist, but cognitive behavior coaching um, uses a lot of the same principles um, to help individuals and businesses to um, think, uh, people to think more healthily and productively mm -hmm. about their circumstances and, and through thinking more healthily and productively to, to act in you know in 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 more kind of generative ways um and through doing that to feel better about themselves or about their yeah. circumstances where so, would you where would you start with that then if you 
no, say if we make it easy by saying it's an individual as opposed to a company, which I always find is slightly more difficult because, you know, a, a company is made up of various parts. But if it's an individual, where do you where would you kind of start with, with coaching them through? Again, it's not about the therapy, but it's kind of applying some of it to helping them lead a, you know, a happier life. Where would I where would I apply this? Where would, where would you start with trying to help them um, by applying CBT? or your version of it as it were. Yeah, CBC. So, um, I mean, it's, it starts with assuming that something's bothering them in some way, um, which is where, where this, this technique is most relevant, really. Um, it starts with, with, with getting an understanding of, of the way that they're seeing that situation. So if someone's uh, anxious about an upcoming presentation, right. it's understanding what what specifically they're, they, they, they're feeling anxious about. Um, so that's the, we talk about the kind of activating event and the activating event in that context would be thinking about presenting in front of 100 people, as yep. an example. And then we'd, then we'd look at uh, um, the feeling for a minute and, and understand actually what, how that feeling was manifesting itself for someone. So. Um, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waking up in the middle of the night and, um, you know, I, I, I'm um, just feeling really anxious. I get cold sweats, et cetera. We don't really dwell on that. We then, we then start to look at the, what they call the, the attitude, the basic attitude, belief about that upcoming event that according to CBC is responsible for the feeling. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so the, the, the belief might be, I absolutely cannot fail at this. Um, it could be anything. It could be, um, you know, um, I absolutely have to be the best at this straight away, for example. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a really, really kind of boiled down version of this, but really then we, then we, then we sort of switch to, well, look, let's, let's, let's think of the worst, which sounds quite counterintuitive, but it's mm -hmm. saying to someone, well, look, you know, what, what is your big fear about that presentation? Well, it's just actually that a few people in the room might think it's terrible. Say, so, well, what if X percentage of the room thought it was terrible? Yeah. And, and get them to actually face that. And often that, often, not always, but often that decatastrophizes it to a certain degree because they don't necessarily think that all, all 100 people are going to start throwing rotten eggs at them and, and telling them that they're terrible. But, but so, you know, and, and they're tolerant of that. Of, they're tolerant of, of maybe a handful of people not liking it, but not necessarily all. So the whole point of this really is to, in the end, get to a point where we, we're, we're really kind of deconstructing what we would say is a fairly kind of rigid attitude around that activating event. Uh, and from that, encouraging them, them to soften that attitude to something right. that's a little bit more real, a bit more yeah. realistic. And that might be, I absolutely cannot fail at anything is the rigid attitude behind that. And, and, it, and we get them to a point through, and it might take some time, where they're saying, you know, I, I, I'd really prefer to be brilliant at everything straight away, but I accept that that's not feasible. Yeah. And if it's, we can just get them to do that, then actually the subsequent thinking that, the, the thinking that follows that softer attitude is more productive, uh, more constructive because because it takes them to a place of going I, if i if i absolutely have to be brilliant at this straight away and if i'm not i'm an idiot they're never mm -hmm. going to re-instruct me again yeah. get covered in in rotten fruit and it takes them to a place that says it's possible that this might not not work as i'd like it and i would prefer to be brilliant straight away but actually in in in, in getting in getting in, in 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 making it most likely that i'll do the best performance I'm able to at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things I can do about that. Got it's such a long answer. No, yeah. I'll tell, tell you why, because it's, it's, it's running through the stages of it in your head, as you say, of, I know for a lot of people, it's kind of the, it's the movie that they're running in their mind of what they think is going to happen. Um, and I know going back to work in the city, we didn't have to give many presentations, but I had friends who, you know, they had fairly senior positions, but they hated standing up and talking in front of people. And it's funny how, you know, they would, it would be like a paralyzing fear that they knew exactly what they were talking about, but they, you know, perhaps weren't focusing on the fact that they were delivering value to other people. Um, and of course it would affect people's career. 
So your, your answer is great because I think you know, for guys listening, it just reminds you that there, there are things that can be done um, and, and that can shape your career, can't it? If, you, if you're unable to get up and, and address a, a, you know, a team or a bigger group yeah. or a whole company. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And there are, I think the, the, the rational part of our minds when we're faced with something that we're concerned about, where we're anxious about rather than concerned, because con, you know, con, concern is a healthy, it's a healthy negative emotion, actually. You don't want, you, it's, it's un, unrealistic to expect someone who's shitting themselves about a presentation in front of 100 people to suddenly not caring about it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just trying to apply some kind of pop psychology, psychology you know, positive mental attitude thing. Just don't think about it. Avoid it. In other words, just bury it or manner or whatever. And yeah. what I love about cognitive behavior coaching is that it's, that it's very, very realistic and, it's, and it's, it's, it's encouraging people to have really fair conversations with themselves. Accurate, fair conversations and fair means, not soft, but also mm-hmm. not too harsh. And, and, um, and accepting that actually, you know, um, I guess adopting an attitude that says, um, you know, it, how I behave about it, how I feel and how I think and how I behave about this largely tracks back to, to how I view it. And there are alternative views to this that I could adopt with practice that would, that would be so much more helpful to my ultimate performance. Has that come down to reframe? Like, are, are you then facilitating a reframe of what they're thinking? You're, yeah, it's a really good question. You, you are encouraging, there, there is an element of reframing, depending on how you define reframing. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not just, it's not just uh, reframing it from good to bad, or it's, it's, it's dealing with the attitude. It's to dealing with that attitude first. And from that, someone is in a better position to reframe. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it's. You know, God, people spend years studying cognitive behaviour therapy, so and, and, and coaching. So I hope that's an adequate enough description. But it is. It's. It's. It's certainly very different to just your standard PMA. Yeah. Stuff. Uh, but it can. But it can encourage really, really quick shifts. And one. One of the shifts that I love. One of the techniques that I use, which is you know, nothing like mind blowing. Is, is if someone is talking about uh, negatively about themselves or a situation and, and damning themselves as being inadequate or you know, not good enough or whatever, yeah. or, you know, then it's always going to happen to them and they're just in a very kind of pessimistic state about something, is actually to encourage them to think, well, look, you know, if, if, you, if, if, your, if your son or your, your best friend came to you and described things exactly as you've described them to me, what would you say to them, Tim? You know, what would be fair and, yeah. and accurate? And often they come out with the same kind of stuff that, huh. that, that, a, that a coach or a dad or a mum or whoever would, would say, you know, but it's it, because yeah. it's come from them, they think actually, no, that's, that, that's, that's, that's fairer. I'll tell you why I think that's, it's, it's a powerful, um, let's call it a tool for want of a better word, but I know I've seen it where um, at one of the events I went to, you know, one, if you had a big challenge, they would say, right, just step out here and tell me what the challenge is. And then who's someone that you see as a, as a hero or a mentor. And, and, and then yeah. imagine you're stepping into that person's shoes and what advice would they give to you? And of course it's so funny how people go, Oh, well, that's easy. Do this, 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 and this. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. So just step back into yourself a minute and you're like, Oh, Oh yeah. Okay. I, I knew that anyway. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, but, but it might, but some people, again, I'm, I do a lot of work around identity actually, and that's right. linked with all of this. And it could well be that you, you encourage someone to do that. And then they'd say, yeah, but I can't do that because that's, you know, I'm not Anthony. Yeah. Uh, Anthony's brilliant at that. You know, he does the podcast. I couldn't do a podcast. Then you- how, how, how could I? And it's like it's un, unpicking that identity, those, those self-limiting beliefs at identity level. I was just going to um, say you go down the route then of limiting beliefs and that's a new, that's a, a new workshop in itself, isn't it? Well, again, you know, you're doing the Gary Lineker here, aren't you? You know, you, I know you're a really experienced coach, so you're, you're asking all the questions here and you, you must just want to kind of jump in with your own views on this. So. Well, I, I, I tell you for me, that, that it's, it's great. I mean, firstly, you're more experienced than I am and, and I've, I only work with individuals, whereas you're working with companies. And, you know, one of the things that for anybody listening or even for myself is you're, you're absorbing the information and even if you know some of it 
sometimes people even reframe it or just give you that something else that you're like, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. And, and I'll tell you why that's great with one of the things you um, had written on your, uh, one of your bios was helping people have the conversations they most need to have with themselves and others. And, and that's huge. I think because a lot of people um, are often either in relationships or in business aren't having the conversations they need to have either because they want to be liked or they're scared of the outcome. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally how, agree. How do you start with that? Or what, you know, where do you even go with that to start with? With helping people. Well, uh, again, it depends on the context really, but I think it starts with the goal. It's like, what, you know, what, what are they, what are they trying to achieve? What's, what's, what does a, a, a an outcome really look like? And I think we're not great. A lot of it, I, a lot of us aren't great. I'm not great at being um, really, really clear on outcomes. We, 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 most of us, even the kind of ones that come across as being pretty driven, and I know this from interviewing a lot of them for all these, these companies we've hired for, when you really, really unpick that, they're not, they're not necessarily that clear on it. They're, they might say, you know, success to me is getting the next promotion. You say, well, where, where does that, where does that come from? What, what makes that important to you? And it's, it's kind of because they saw a, saw a promotion opportunity on a, you know, uh, in the company, and they think it'd be a good idea. Yeah, because at, at, at an identity level, they've they've just identified with being, you know, a thrusting, ambitious executive, and that may be the case. That might be a a good reason. It might be, a, you know, it might might be a great thing that they take that promotion. But I think most of us, at times, have sleepwalked through uh, parts of our careers or parts of individual conversations with ourselves or with others without really thinking about what the goal is. So. Yeah. First of all, start with that. Step that up to something that's meaningful. So if you can find more meaning in, in, in what you're doing, in the goal that you have, then that's, that makes it really compelling for you. Um, yeah. uh, that, that's, that's the kind of start of it. And then it's kind of tracking back to, well, actually, now, now how do I execute this? How do I, how do I ensure that I make this happen? Do I have enough resources at my own disposal now to do it, or do I need help? Have I got the skills and the knowledge appropriate to, to do that now? Um, do I know how to get those? Do I know who to ask or where to, where to turn to? Um, am I prepared to do that? Is the goal important enough to me? So am I genuinely motivated to do it? Um, and who, do I, who else is involved in this? How do I yeah. get them to, 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 to come along with me, support me, um, you know, challenge me so that, so that what I produce is of the quality that I identified as important to me? etc so well, it's, it's, it's a really it's all but it's you know it's you hit, you hit on the start. first one which was uh, uh, um what's the phrase i'm trying to use? like start with why yeah well i like i like i like what makes actually right which are, rather than a what the why i mean we all say why a lot more than what makes don't we but i think a why sometimes can get someone into a into a mindset where they're where they're justifying their decision or their proclamation Right. Yeah. I think of what I think of what makes like a really if you really ask him, you've got to kind of calibrate how you ask this. But if you if you ask somebody about what makes that important to them, you often get kind of richer information. Um, I've just I've just learned something. Thank you. Because that's great. I, you know, with with the start with why it reminds me of my three year old saying why to everything. You know, can you come here? Why can you do this? Why? 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 And actually, I've I can find it taxing on the brain, but as you say, just changing the language and creating a, for want of a better word, a beautiful question, um, can, can bring out different results. And what about, I know you said, uh, sometimes with people, it's, it's trying not to be too hard on them, but not be too soft on them. So how, if you were, po if you were, and he said poaching, that's different to coaching. And um, if you were coaching a, an individual, um, yeah. you know, where do you, where do you stand on, you know, demanding they get work done or do you say, look, it's up to you and, you know, do you ask them to kind of report back to you? And, uh, I mean, it, it depends on the, depends on the coaching contract really. So a lot of work I do is in a business setting. So although I'm dealing with individuals, I do a team of teams as well, but often do with individuals and we end up talking about their lives as well as their work. The business is often paying me. So some businesses will offer coaching services at senior level a lot but sometimes mid-level too 
and just entrust the coach and the coachee to to work on whatever's helpful for that person. Yeah. And a lot of my work is that. And I love, I mean, I love both, but I love that because that's just the business saying we trust, we're backing up our individual, the person that, that's, that we put into coaching um, and whatever's good for them is good for the business. Um, so often we get that completely free reign. And in that situation, then you'd be saying to the coachee, what's important to you? You know, yeah. really, really what's important to you. Um, but sometimes a, a business will, because it's not cheap, will um, come with an issue. You know, they've, they've, got, they've got someone who they want more, more from um, or, or, or who, yeah, they, they, they want more from in some way. They want them to change in some way. They might want them to kind of step up into a more senior position and take people with them, um, uh, for example. And in that situation, you've kind of got to get the buy-in of, the coachee otherwise it's certainly going to be short term and games yeah. you get to be short term so um then it's about kind of well first of all agreeing three way that that's what you're going to work on and then getting the coachee on their own and saying look how does this how does this work for you and you know and 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 sometimes it doesn't and that's when you've got to be very clear and boundaried with both parties about what's confidential and what isn't and uh you know, with that, have situations has... where, where somebody's somebody's moved moved from a company because actually what the boss wants isn't what they're prepared isn't what they're prepared to deliver or isn't what they're able to deliver. But most of the time, because they're investing in people that they value, you can you can build a consensus between the coachee and the business, and that's again back to ensuring that the goal the goal for a bit for the business might be different to the goal to the person. The goal to the business might be. Um, getting more money from that person, right? Being more productive. The goal for the for, for the person might be being promoted. Well, if if they're doing the right things for the business, they should be making more money. And if they're doing the right things for the business, they should be promoted. So you can just start to sort of bridge between between the objectives of the business and the person where where you can. Yeah. So it's trying to. Uh, I was trying to think of the word there, but like trying to find some alignment between the two, so they're both working towards the same thing. Um, yeah, or at least, you know, they, they don't necessarily have to be working towards the same thing. They need to both get the outcomes that they want. And that's that that's where there's a that's where the kind of negotiation and the the unpicking of 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 the concerns and the un, you know the unpicking of the real goals and get setting really specific goals is that's where that, that comes in. Yeah. Um but you know, people are coaching is different to training, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, it's got it's you've got to start with somebody being bought into it and, and actually if you assume that that person has most of the resources if not all of the resources to or to do what they need to do a coach's job is to is to help guide support them to to get there um, but they don't want to go they're not going to go yeah yeah you, i guess yeah you, know, you can know you can nudge people in the right direction but um does that also come down to the what I've seen sometimes the confusion between a coach, um, a consultant and a mentor. So I always think as a, as a mentor is someone who has trodden the path and has done what you want to do. A consultant is maybe bought into, um, you know, how can I put it, deal with a, a problem. And, and a coach is about extracting the answers that you already have within you. I mean, that's a, that's a really beautiful description. Um, I agree with you. Um, I guess I, you know probably the same when you're coaching people. It's you can you can end up doing a mixture of all of those things in a in a, in a coaching context. Yeah. As long as as long as that's you're explicit that that's you've agreed that that's something that they're open to, um, and the people who are paying you see that as relevant. But I mean, there's certainly there are different there are various different coaching techniques. We mine mine typically is more active directive than than some, mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it, it depends. Some people just, just want to be asked the right kinds of questions. They want to own all their own solutions. Um, some people are at a loss sometimes and they just want somebody who's outside the organization who's, you know, who they feel knows them and knows what they're up against to just give them some, a bit of advice or a bit of a clue or, yeah. you know, a bit of a steer. And, and I, I don't, I just don't get to, too het up on 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 the titles you know um yeah. it's, it's got to work for the person uh, so uh, but if you're in a coaching if you're in a coaching situation and and you're talking as much as i'm doing on this <laughs> jesus you 
you've blown it because you're not you're not coaching you just you're just telling I, I i guess it's that um you know what's the saying everybody could do with just talking to a lamppost um because often you know some of the guys i know that have done coaching will say that they've actually just kind of felt like they've sat and listened for 80 percent of the time and the person will have run through their I can't do this. Well, I guess I could do this. Well, I could do this. When could I do this? And suddenly they found their solution. Um, but maybe yeah. as, as we know, it's, um, you know, listening is a skill in itself. Big time. Yeah. Really, really. You've got to, you know, you, some people are brilliant at it to start with, but I think most of us have got to learn, learn when to shut up, you know? So up now. For, no, I was going to say for you go, going through, um, you know, going through the career you've had, who, who do you talk to? Um, I mean, going, going back to the reason why we're together here is, is talk about the whole man Academy. And we're always about, I always think if you're a young guy listening to this and go back to myself and my friends, and I know none of us had anybody to talk to, or sorry, we did have people to talk to. We didn't talk to them because we thought either they didn't want to listen or we didn't know how to start a conversation. But for yourself, I just wondered going through the, the years you've been working as a professional, doing coaching and development, et cetera, like how have you found it with having someone to talk to, if at all? Uh, I mean, I'm in, I'm in coaching supervision, which, um, and actually if somebody's considering coaching, I think it's a really good question to ask a coach, is it, are they in supervision? Um, because it's, it, it, there's an investment in that. And, um, you know, it, I think it demonstrates that they're prepared to invest and, and and that they that they that they they're keeping learning and keeping trying to keep themselves on track. So I do that, and uh, I mean I'm very lucky. I've got a real uh, he's a complete guru actually in in counselling and and uh, and cognitive behaviour therapy. I've um, been supervised by a professor Windy Dryden is his name, strange name, um, and he's published over twenty two hundred and thirty four books I think now. Wow, um, all on on um, mainly on feelings and. Um, I really recommend them, and I'm not plugging it. He's, he's sold plenty of books already, but um, so 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 I, he he's a counsel that I keep. Um, over the years, I've done a lot of self development, as I said. Yeah. Um, oh, the honest answer is, over a career, I haven't done enough of it. I've, right. I'm, you know, I'm a northeast boy originally. I'm 50 years old, and probably I'm making an excuse for myself. My generation didn't tend to do that. Um, I, I'm now much more aware of the value of coaching and just, just having like older mentors, just people who just get you and, 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 and care about you and, 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 you know, and want the best for you. Um, but I'm probably not the best example of someone who's got a huge network of those. If I'm I, honest. I guess um, sometimes you just need one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you do. I, 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 I tend to sort of get, sounds a bit weird but i get different things from different people so on on the coaching side i've, I've definitely scoured scoured europe really for the best people to learn from so I've, yeah. I've worked under judith lowe who's one of the top nlp um practitioners around windy dryden for cognitive behavior coaching um i've kind of sat under the wing a little bit of, of, of uh, martin newman who's an emotional intelligence expert um you know i did a sports science degree at loughborough at, at a time when um Graham Jones was was the, the chief psychologist there, yeah. and he he went on to to to, to launch Lane Four, which is a major performance coaching organisation. So, I've definitely kind of looked for really really good people to learn from, um, and then I've done what everybody you know I walk around the park with a bloody audible on and do all that stuff like like everybody. Yeah. I'm not sure how much of it goes in, but I, I, I try. You should try listening to it of a night when you're asleep and it slowly goes in. That's uh, oh man, honestly, yeah. it just drives me nuts. It's not my learning style at all. Le learning while sleeping. Well, you, it's funny actually. It lead, leads me on to my next question, which you just mentioned those words, uh, emotional intelligence, um, and probably a lot of people will just go, "Oh yeah, emotional intelligence," and then not have a clue what it actually means. Um, and I know you said about assessing emotional intelligence. Could you kind of just explain? Um, you know what emotional intelligence is and how you assess it. Yeah, so um, I think most of us have probably got a good sense of what emotional intelligence is already. Already, really, but one description is um, it involves someone being really, uh, really understanding their own emo emotions and how their emotions affect their behaviour. And then a second component is um, understanding other people and how they might think and behave to the best as best as best we can and through 
that self-understanding and that empathy of others. Oh, my Siri's just gone off. Here we are. Okay. Siri's telling you what the answer is there. She's listening. Empathy, right. She's listening, I know. Yeah. Um, so sorry. So through understanding um, self and others, leveraging our own kind of qualities in order to achieve what we what we can through our communication and through our kind of mind management and through our um, uh, um, behaviors. Um, that's a bad description that you might want to re-record, but that's all right. It works for me. I think that. Uh, even for myself, I know when I've I've been guilty of it in the past, and maybe still do, where you'll read something. Um, it's a bit like our creative director Scott MacArthur, um, who is a uh, a chap who sometimes come out with um, sayings and words. And, and when I first met him, I'd say, "Yeah," and I think I don't have a clue what you're talking about. So now I, I realise not to be shy in saying, "I don't." Can you just explain that to me? And often, a simple explanation means the penny drops, and it all becomes a bit clearer. But um, yeah, even for myself, I'm I'm learning through the podcast to just say, I think I know what that means, but can you kind of just clarify it for me? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the yeah, the the phrase was kind of popular, popularized by a guy called Daniel Goldman in the in the 1990s, a book called Emotional Intelligence, um, um, and he was a journalist actually, and he just picked through all the all the research, all the kind of psychological research you could find and found this 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 thing called emotional intelligence or EQ. And um, you know what 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 most of the research was saying was that EQ um, was at least as as big a um, influencer on someone's overall kind of life success as IQ. Um, really according to the research, we all need a level of IQ in most, you know, in order to function and do yep. uh, perform but everything else really is about how you you know how you manage your emotions and how you how you how you show up yeah um how you react to what's around you the environment you're in and the people that you that you meet and the thoughts that you have um and so i, I mean i love all that i love that as much as the cognitive behavior stuff because it's it's just i just find it really really interesting yeah um, and then you can assess it i mean you mentioned assessment tools and mm. um you know there are there are various i mean the you know the, the the kind of oldest one that's still used is eqi which is a psychometric psychometric being a kind of questionnaire that that you that somebody fills out that spits out lots of observations um the one that i'm trained in is called the emotional capital report okay which is brilliant and that's uh Created by a guy called Martin Newman um, and his partner Judy Purse, um, and again, it's it's a, it's a ten minute, ten fifteen minute psychometric, um, and it shows you what you you're reporting as your strengths across a, a range of what they call competencies, right. um, things like self confidence, um, um, self control, adaptability, um, optimism. Um, and so it's not really, you know, it's, it's, it's less about the score that you give yourself on that. It's more about the conversation that that opens up with a coach or a facilitator. Yeah. Um, and, and what, what you learn about yourself and your, and the way that you work from that. So Would that be similar like to IQ where you just get, you know, if you've 150, you're you get a number. No, no, no. You know, it's a... that's, that's a really good point actually, because I remember having a, um, it was around the time I learned about disc profiling. Oh yeah, yeah. There's... And you know, I, you know, there's some people that think that profiling is a lot of rubbish. Other people that have built businesses around it, and I, I just think it's a really good, like you said, it's a conversation starter. Because yeah. um, my my issue, with, and it's so funny you said that, was that someone said about just bring clever people in. But you're like, well, you know, you, you need different people in a company who have got different strengths, and just because yes. you're clever doesn't mean you can manage a team. Um, so yeah, that's I'm yeah. very much myself find those things interesting because you can then sit, even if it's with your partner, or I know there was you know, disc profiling for children as well, just as a, as a lighter version of it, but you know, some of us are a, a, a people person, others just want to be left on their own and work and you know, not, not bothered. So it's, um, I, don't know, it's a, I think the profiling is, is, a, is a powerful way, as you say, to start a conversation. I think as long as, as, long as, it, doesn't, um, as, long as it doesn't box people, I think, I haven't heard of disc for children. I think they, they um, I mean, DISC, disc is, a, is a personality tool. It's personality psychometric, so it's different to emotional intelligence. Um, you know, and, and it's, 
there are loads out there, aren't there? You do a million yeah. online and it says, oh, you're a bit of this type of person. And I think you've got, without being too kind of, well, I'm not an intellectual, but without being too intellectually snooty about it, you, you know, you, you've, got to pick, you've got to pick your psychometrics because a lot of them are just total nonsense. Yeah. Um, but I think if you go to the kind of main ones, and DISC is a, is a very popular one, and, you know, and Myers-Briggs and, um, you know, ECR and others, then, then you can get a great deal from them. But it's yeah. just part, it's just, as you say, it's just kind of part of the part of the picture and it's about the conversation it starts, really. Yeah. Everybody no. loves, you know, it's better than a horoscope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it, uh, like you said, I, I, I think for for many companies, I mean, when I, you know, throughout the whole time working in the city, I, I'd love now to go back and actually use any of that profiling to, if you're bringing in a new, a new employee, a new candidate on your desk, because you're working in a small team of, you know, between four to 16 guys sitting on a desk and you know it, mo- it might have helped us um avoid some mistakes when you brought people in and they very quickly you thought this this person just doesn't quite fit in the team well look, at least at least you have asked the right kinds of questions at interview i think i think the bother is and the bother with psychometrics is and if they're in the wrong hands they're taken too lightly or too seriously or you know and, and it's it, it's just it's just part just part of the feedback but if you but if you you don't have to listen to them, you just need to be aware of them. Yeah. But the validated ones are worth listening to to a degree. You know, there's there's something in them. There's something there's something um, I, real I, about them. I guess. I was guess it's that try, try as many as you can and see what see what comes up. Um, what comes up yeah. what, what, then get what on the, with it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess also it comes down to um, we haven't even touched the word procrastination or you know paralysis of analysis. But I, I'm always one of these people that says just do something. You know, you, some people jump from course to course or probably from test to test, and at the end you're like, listen, at some point you've got to pull the trigger and 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 get on with something. Um, exactly. Which which is uh, I know we spoke to someone about personal development the other day, and they said. Uh, and I've been guilty of it in the past. You, you do a course and then I, I do another course and a, and a master's trainer's course of that course. And then you're like, who are you applying it to? No one. I need to learn more first. Oh man, I know. Well, I know. I mean, I'm doing that at the moment. I've done, I've done so many courses since lockdown and it's all good stuff, but you, you, yeah. it's uh, that the, the, the business model is selling courses, I think more than, more than coaching or training now. Yeah. Or, or teaching how to sell courses is the course. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'm conscious of your time, and obviously, you've already given us a, an hour of your valuable time this morning. But one of the the last questions we always ask, really, is um, for for the guys listening, is what would your um, advice be on how to do life better? And that could be something in business or or, or personal that either you know works for you or you've learned from one of your um, kind of mentors through life. Oh, God, that's a big old question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound a bit humble and not worthy here but I, you know it, but i mean it, it i'm not in a position to tell someone how to do their life better mm-hmm. um because because it's not my life and and so i suppose i suppose a, if i'm if i'm pressed on it i suppose doing life better is deciding what better is for you and that's deeply individual it really is and um i guess it, it, in terms of advice just pick pick what you think is success and ensure that that isn't wholly about what what you think that will bring you because that isn't guaranteed um and you know think very carefully about how much how much of why you're doing that thing boils down to what other people will think because that's not really important <laughs> yeah yeah no it's a- you know what i mean i think yeah, it's just it's- um I guess there's a thing of people, you know, climbing the ladder to success, but make sure it's leaning against the right wall. Um, completely, completely. And, you know, I think, I don't know, it, self-esteem is a really, is something that I'm sure you talk a lot with people about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, self-esteem is, 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 is not a great thing because it's, it's about, that's about other people. It's about rating yourself really against a kind of some kind of score self-imposed scorecard and you do that based on on what you see other people are doing yeah and and that's you know they say that that isn't the healthiest activity and that we should be more about um you know what they call um positive self-regard unconditional positive self-regard and that's basically accepting 
that we're fallible, we're fallible human beings, um, that, um, that we're in a really, really changeable environment. Mm. So if Especially at the moment. Brilliant. Exactly. If we think we're brilliant today, then you know, what, what are we going to be comparing ourselves to tomorrow? Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know. It, so my advice would be go and look up unconditional positive self-regard and adopt that in your attitude, your flexible attitude to life. Um, and then, and then at the very least, you'll be more satisfied and more comfortable with you um, than than you were before. And 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 yeah, I don't know. Isn't that what life's about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that, as, as you were saying, it it made me think of the saying: uh, "Comparison is a thief of joy." So, oh, all right, I'm going to write that down. Comparison is a thief of joy. Yeah, so I always yeah. say there's always someone doing better than you and always someone doing worse than you. But often you'll look at who's doing better and, and you know, feel negatively about that. And you're like, you know, everybody's uh, sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're behind. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I think the thing is, I think it's easy. I think it's easy for us to say things like that and somebody to walk away going, yeah, but it's fine for them. Or actually, that doesn't really relate to me or um you know, or actually, I don't want to. I don't want to um, compromise on my standards, and that's just. I'm, I'm not prepared to just accept myself and be average. Mm. And I think that's that's not really what. Certainly not what I'm saying. I don't think what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's not. It's it's it's. Um, it, this is about people being in the best position psychologically, physiologically, to to be the best of what they choose is important for them, as long as it's realistic and doable. You know, but it can be massively stretching. And if it's massively stretching, great, because you're going to get more joy out of doing that, more satisfaction out of doing it. Well, you, um, you said that question again, which I thought was great. And, and it's, it's so funny because I think often people will answer without thinking. But, you know, that question of what is success to you? Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you'd have asked me or some of my colleagues that worked in the city years ago, success meant having the, the car the house, the watch, what have you. And actually, if you ask me now, it is more about, you know, living a fulfilled life and enjoying time with your family. And, you know, yeah. I guess it depends on what stage of life you are as well. Completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been, this has been good stuff and hopefully something for people to, uh, to think about. And um, just going forward, if, if any of the guys wanted to get in touch with you about either coaching or more about your business, what would be the best way to, uh, to contact you? Yeah, lovely. So um, my website is groundandair.co.uk groundandair.co.uk um, and that's my coaching website that's probably best I'm on LinkedIn Jim Brown uh, and yeah very happy to help anyone or hear from anyone and, 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 and chat things through if um, um, you've got some you've got some proper serious guests on your show I've been looking at your your back catalogue so uh, <laughs> but if, if they want to, if they want an ordinary bloke who's about to turn 51 I'm here <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to have you in my corner, put it that way. So I, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but no, I, we'll, we'll make sure we put the, um, your website and stuff on the show notes as well. Yeah, lovely. Um, and also just acknowledge you for the work you're doing because, you know, forgetting it's, it, it's companies, but ultimately it's about helping people, like we say, do life better because, you know, all, all the all the knowledge that you've got ultimately is driving people in, you know, towards a, hopefully a life of fulfillment. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the plan, isn't it? And that's I think that's what you're doing with the whole man academy, aren't you? So uh, we're getting there. You're on you, mate. I like your t-shirt as well. Good, good you brand, go. mate. I need to get a new one done. Uh, uh, it's since we've rebranded, uh, I haven't been able to get to the the printers, so uh, it's it's on my small to do list. But um, right, well, Jim, I, I will say thank you very much. Yeah. and let you go, and then uh, and hopefully we will uh, we will speak to you soon. Nah, thanks for inviting me. It's a real honour to be invited. So appreciate it. Cheers. <laughs>